Hello there, I'm Black Riot, broadcasting out of the UK. Welcome to my channel. First time you're passing through, you know the drill. Thumbs up, thumbs down, subscribe or share. Um, today I wanted to um, talk about whether or not re-education would manage racism or improve racism. Um, I'm not a historian, so I'm not going to quote any dates or go back in history, and I don't even... Um, I got one out of his one out of a hundred for history, so that shows you how bad I am. I got one out of a hundred for geography, that shows you how bad I am. But I did get a hundred out of a hundred for English, and I got a hundred out of a hundred for art. So there's a kind of a balance there. But all I'm trying to say is that I'm not going to come from the position of an intellect or an academic. I'm just going to put forward my little views on whether or not. Um, rewriting history is the answer to tackling racism. So I wrote down, been thinking about it over the last couple of days and I wrote down some notes. So if you know my normal format, time to read and then I ad lib and you know, you know how the story goes. So I think it needs to be rewritten because otherwise people like Nick Ferrari telling Afua Hirsch, why doesn't she leave England? if she doesn't like certain things to do with England, shows ignorance. She was born in Wimbledon to a British father and a Ghanaian mother. Where is she meant to go? And that is the um, problem. That is where um, racists need to be educated. Because the assumption is, as long as you don't have a white skin, you do not belong here. You are an immigrant. And what happens is, is that for people who are born here, like Afia Hirsch, okay, she's mixed race, but same person, same like my daughter. My daughter's born here. I'm born here. We're both born in Britain. You know what I mean? Okay, my grandparents are, my, you know, my mother isn't. And so as far as the um, legislation is concerned or whatever documents they have, the My Good Observatory, I, I'm a migrant. I'm still a migrant, even though I'm born in the UK, because as long as your parent isn't born in the UK, you're considered a migrant. And that is where this comes from. When somebody like Nick Ferrari, and there's many others say that, when they say, go back to where you come from, it's coming from the viewpoint that you are a migrant because your parents weren't born here. And it's presupposing that if your parents had been born here, I mean, which parents are going to be born here? But for my my mother's generation, they're not. So it's presupposing that as long as um, your my my daughter's grandparents aren't born in this country, they're immigrants, and therefore you have somewhere to go back to. The fact is, is that that we don't have anywhere to go back to. We can't go back to our parents' country. Because just like England, you need a visa, you need to apply, you could only go there for a little while, maybe six months, I don't even think they'd give you six months first go, probably 90 days or three months, well 90 days is three months, but yeah, so it is that kind of premise why people need to be re-educated. Um, rewriting history would mean that government officials would have known about the Commonwealth citizens and their rights to British citizenships and we wouldn't have had the Windrush scandal. It's because people in the Home Office had no idea about British history or Caribbean history or African history, why they pounced on so many black people and rendered them as being illegal immigrants. Rewriting history would mean that African and Caribbean achievements would be integrated into the national curriculum creating less negative stereotypes and biased assumptions. Um, and Farage is another one. He's another one that needs re-educating. I mean, you know, there's just so many assumptions made and negative stereotypes. There doesn't seem to be a balanced view of history, just constant reminders of transatlantic slave trade, reenactments of slave auctions and the history of black people needs to be reflected in a more balanced and holistic way. Fed up of watching um, the slavery, fed up of watching George getting his, his, his breath um, 
pumped out of him. You know, there's positive things that you can show on TV. Fed up of watching the protests. And they're sh- focusing on those disruptive elements of the protests. You know, if you want to create harmony and if you want to tackle racism, start showing positive role models on the media. Start showing the people who are doing well and the people who have achieved and say, well, look, you know, this is a country where these people were raised. Look what they've accomplished. Look what they're doing. They're not all criminals. They're not all um, unemployed. They're not all aggressive. We have X amount of people in university. We have X amount of people as doctors, as lawyers, as teachers, as doctors, as nurses. You know, focus on them instead and create some kind of balance. That would help towards changing perceptions of black people. If on the television, yes, you have a couple of people on um, Good Morning Britain who who speak quite eloquently, but they're they're talking on a specific cause. We want we want more um, recognition for contributions that have been made, and for young people to see those contributions. And those are the kind of things that need to be on main mainstream media and that is a way of re-educating and changing perceptions um what else did i want to say if if black history had been integrated into world history there would be an awareness of how many black people contributed around the world the contributions of people to world history is not taught in schools nor widely known by the general public. For example, how many white people know that Daniel H. Williams performed the first open heart surgery? I bet not many. If we can commemorate Winston Churchill, Thomas Edison and people like Marie Curie, we can similarly celebrate Marcus Garvey. Well, Marcus Garvey isn't born here, but Louis Latimer, who perfected the light bulb. Well, what I'm saying is, is that there are equivalent black heroes who you I mean when you think about um, the British units all of those um, black people who who fought in the army and who led and who were you know who were marshals and corporals in the army I mean why isn't there statues up there if you're looking for somebody credible and Who's, who stood, um, who protected Britain and who did something for Britain, Though they should have their statutes up. So if you're going to have Edward Colston, I mean, I know he's been taken down, put up a parallel so that people can see that the balance, that's what we're looking for, balance. At the moment, it only looks like there's a white history in Britain when that's not the case. Okay, so um, we don't want to be constantly assigned labels of underachiever, crime, poverty and dysfunctional families. Patrick Hutchinson, the black man who protected the white injured protester, confirmed that this is not black against white, although the media would have us believe that it's anti-racist against racists. Rewriting history will change perceptions of black people. Kevin Maxwell, ex-police officer, who worked in Manchester and London, shared his thoughts on racism in the police force with Piers Morgan and Susanna Reid the other day, as it relates to black men in Britain. And this is how racism acts out and lack of knowledge and stereotypes. It's all got to do with the same type. When the police pick up black men, it's based on an assumption. It's based on a stereotype. It's based on miseducation. So, black men in Britain, nine times more likely to be stopped and searched, three times more likely to be arrested, three times more likely to be tasered, four times more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act. And that is worse than prison, because once you're detained under the Mental Health Act, you've got no way of coming out. So sometimes people think, oh, yeah, you know, they, you know, they go to the courts and they say, you know, OK, do you want to plead because she was behaving aggressive? Do you want to plead um, insanity or plead under the Mental Health Act and instead of um, going to prison? And a lot of black people probably think, oh, yeah, that'd be better if it's under the Mental Health Act. It's worse. 
Not only do they pump you up with drugs, you ain't coming out. So two times more likely to die in police custody through use of force. And with the Mental Health Act, of course, that's not a generalisation. There are people who do eventually get out if they've got people to back them up. People are pursuing, people are watching. But by and large, a lot of black people in mental institutions are in there for an extraordinary long time, if they come out at all. OK, um, two times more likely to die in police custody through the use of force or restraint. Half of young people in prison are black or brown, even though black people constitute only 3.5% of the population in England, 0.7% in Scotland and 0.6% in Wales. I believe including brown minority ethnics, it brings the figure up to about 12%. But even that, just 12% total black and ethnic minorities, black and browns, and yet they constitute 50% of the prison population. So there's something not quite right there. Very, very disproportionate. The same disproportionate with when they were talking about the COVID, the coronavirus. And when you see this kind of disproportionality and it's kind of justified with the, um, the, the black men in prison is based on, oh, they had drugs, they were aggressive, they were resisting arrest, they were doing that. It's robbery, it's some kind of criminal background, it's you know, illegal immigration, whatever it is. And, you know, with the coronavirus, they justify that disproportionality by or that disparity by saying, oh, they've got underlying symptoms, they've got this, they've got that, they're poor. They're... There's always a reason why black people are, are disproportionately adversely affected in these negative situations or these kind of situations. And it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. Black alone, not even other minorities, including mixed race, make up 3.5% of, of the population. That's since the 2011 census. Why haven't they updated the 2011 census? I mean, that's bloody, look how long ago, it's over nine years. I would have thought they'd be updating it every three to four years. Every you have to keep referring to this 2011 census anyway. 3.5 percent blacks in the country, and you have people like Farage going on like we're taking over the country, you know, like we're everywhere. And maybe to, to, to some racists, it might seem as though we're everywhere because one is one too many. So if they even see a few, it's still too many, but it's still as though they're taking over because they don't want to see any. So, you know, but it is about re-educating. I don't know if you can re-educate racists. I don't, because I think they have tunnel vision. And I don't think they're like the regular white people who, you know, are open-minded, who um, are rational and who are open up to discussion and they're open up to some form of debate. Race, the real racists are not like that. Tunnel vision. And even, I was watching this program, one of those talk shows, it was quite a while ago, and I forget which show it was on, but you know when it was equivalent to one of those um, host shows, and apparently um, a, a white woman who goes with a black man or an Asian man, anyone who's not white, is not considered white. They do, they reckon that they, that person has rejected their whiteness if they go on the other side and get with a black or an Asian or whatever. So it is, um, that is how it's viewed. So what I'm trying to say is that people who think like that, I don't think any form of education opening up their eyes, even if you was to turn around history and if you, even if you was to put it in their face, that, you know, there was kings, there was queens, there was scientists, there's this and that that black people did. They'd still find, they'd still find something to say it's not true. They just would not believe it. They would just, they would just denounce it. So there are certain people who are not able to be educated or enlightened because they don't want to be. I mean, to be enlightened is a choice. To be re-educated is a choice. We're fortunate that with, um, 
yes, I keep saying George George Floyd was a sacrifice, but we're fortunate that we have so many people, especially white people, who are enlightened, who want to learn more, who are learning more, who are investigating, who are, I mean, I saw this white guy do this poem, ah, oh, it was absolutely brilliant, should have, I should have shown it to you, but, you know, I might even let it speak for itself and show it separately. But, you know, it's just showing you the awareness and how people were genuinely ignorant about what was going on and the suppression and oppression of black people. And I think it, I think re-educating people would make a massive difference. It won't solve all the problems, but it would still help. And we're not looking for positive... You know when they... Um, well, I forget what they call it, positive... Oh, I forget what they call it. You know, like when they um they had this thing where they were promoting black people for jobs, and you know, so they they wanted to get more black people doing this and more black people that. That's not what we're looking for. We're just looking for fairness. So we don't want you know the governments and all that to start doing the I, it's got a name and I can't think of what they call it it's called positive something I don't think it's positive reinforcement I can't remember what it's called but that's not what we're asking for we're just asking for equality not to be treated better not to be favored not just because you found out all of this that we're supposed to get some special kind of treatment that's not what this is about this is just about lifting the lid on racism seeing what we can do to tackle it and the best way to tackle it. And I think re-education is a step towards that because it would make a lot of people um, view the history. They might even start revisiting the history books. I mean, you just never know. And when they realise that, OK, what's going on in the media, it's all a part of the same story. It's, a lot of it is fictional. A lot of it's to create some kind of image then you know even that would make a difference so we had the third anniversary of Grenfell Tower June so three years already oh I'll never forget that morning but um, they reckon that there were 72 registered dead but we know that there was more than that it's just that a lot of those people could, there could have been illegal immigrants in there people who weren't supposed to be in there they weren't supposed to be in there they would not have been recorded. So that's a sad thing about that. But that, that I think that tower block housed about, around about 300 people. And so, yeah, so we have to wave the flag for that. Um, there is a, and I think that event should go down in history because that building was predominantly immigrants in that. And they're, there are some conspiracy theories as to why it went down and there was an insurance policy taken out just a couple of weeks before and you have to kind of think, you know, it went down so quickly and, you, that you know, there's, um, I keep saying, you know, um, the cladding that was on the Grenfell Tower is still in a lot of high-rise flats and that hasn't been redressed. So you have to kind of think, it's a bit like um, the coronavirus, you know, you have all this hype and then you have all these kind of um, measures in place and then all of a sudden these measures kind of slowly, slowly disappear. It's a bit like the Grenfell Tower. They were supposed to be changing every single building that had that cladding in it. And I understand um, from Piers Morgan the other day that that cladding is still in a lot of those buildings. And, you know, Grenfell Tower will soon die off. But there are a few people saying every year we're going to come back to this place. Every single year we're not going to allow these people to die in vain. So that should be a, a historical moment. Um, there's a question of the, the question mark on the statues. But like I was saying, instead of having people like Edward Colston and um, Winston Churchill um, why not they, why wouldn't they, they could be replaced by someone like Lord Dunmore or Genry, General Henry Clinton if they want white representatives of um, positive white representatives. Those were, um, they offered sanctuary to slaves. So that's a positive. 
it's to do with slavery, but it's a positive element of slavery. They weren't slave traders. They actually um, offered sanctuary. So a lot of people, in, a lot of slaves ended up leaving America and coming to the UK. Okay, so they were um, army fodder. And, you know, they were given menial tasks, but still better than slavery. But, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, put, um, if you want to put up statues to commemorate people who have done well in history, you know, think and think how it can be um, all inclusive. Somebody who benefits white people and somebody who benefits black people. And those two... As far as I understand, I could be wrong. They seem to be positive. Harry Washington should be heralded. He was an African slave of George Washington who fled slavery to join Lord Dunmore. That's, a, that's the um, man I mentioned earlier. And eventually became a corporal in a black British regiment, the company of the Black Pioneers. The Black Pioneers were a British provincial military unit raised for loyalist service during the American Revolutionary War, led by the famous commanders was Connell Stephen Buck. He was, he was from Barbados. And he served from 1775 to 1783. And Connell Tye, apparently he was the most feared and respected guerrilla. I don't know what, I don't know what nationality he was. I've got a funny feeling he was Haitian. But yeah, put up a couple of statues of that. Those, they fought for British liberty. Today, the black pioneers would have been called military engineers, but they were given menial tasks and called to fight to work under heavy fire and dangerous conditions. The education would highlight, among a lot of other things, Jersey Shore volunteers made up of free slaves, Jamaica Rangers, Mosquito Shore Volunteers, Shadow Rangers, Black River Volunteers, they all represented British units. Where is that in the history books? There's nowhere to be found. So their contribution should be acknowledged and taught in school so that young people are aware and can see um, the contributions. So in a nutshell, rewriting history will illustrate black people's contributions to the country. As long as white people are taught that black people are dossers and criminals, their perception of us will not change. As long as statues of black commanders are not celebrated, they will not be aware of the historic contribution by black people. Britain would like the masses to believe that black people have not made any contributions, that they were only slaves, and that is not true. And when I'm talking about Britain, I'm talking about the people who... Um, write the curriculum and all that kind of stuff and who promote what needs to be taught or what needs to be highlighted. Past assertions such as David Hume saying that Africans were at the bottom of the ladder, compounded by Jim Crow's one-drop rule to create a hierarchy where blacks were at the bottom, needs to be revisited and the truth told. The notion that blacks are uneducated, belligerent, criminally minded and violent needs to be rewritten or supported by evidence and not contrived evidence where certain police turn off their body-worn cameras and only turn it on when they have provoked a black man to resist or protest to make their excessive force look justified. As long as black people have been assigned as racially inferior and racially mixed persons are assigned to a subordinate group, in quotes, miseducated black men are more likely to cling to white partners to lift them up and make them feel better about themselves. So... That's what I decided to talk to you about today. I don't know what I'm going to get. Maybe I'll get a backlash. Maybe I'll get a history lesson. Maybe I'll be told to go and read up and, and learn this and learn that, like some of my subscribers always telling me about, oh, you know, you need to learn your history. You need to learn this. You need to. No, I don't like reading history books. All I'm saying, this is a, from a layperson's perspective. For me, a common sense perspective. And I am delighted if. Um, those people who are more knowledgeable put comments in, um, either supplement what I've said, correct what I've said, improve what I've said, because this is just about a dialogue. This isn't me talking the truth. This is just my opinion. This is not me saying this is how it is or this is how, you know, 
it should be. This is me um, telling, well, just explaining how I think things could be improved. And if you can add to it and improve it, it's fantastic because you've got a lot of people, um, you know, integrating. Different subscribers are talking to each other. I don't always get to go in there and um, subscribe because, like I said, you know, I work full time. I do a lot of other things. So I don't always get to go in and look at the comments. But, you know, just the just the group of you who are interested in this topic can debate about it amongst yourself. So we each one educates another. And you can educate me the same way I, you know, I put things out there. You can educate me as well. And that's what I'm looking forward to. And that's all for now. Bye bye.